Thank you. Um, uh, members are content to proceed. Um, can I welcome members to the 12th meeting of the Audit Committee? Uh, we have apologies from uh, Emma Rogan, uh, MLA, and Joanne Bunting, uh, MLA. Uh, we have uh, Alan Chambers remotely doing it, Lowell, and we have Jim Allister in the committee room. Um, I, can, can I remind members that uh, they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest before and during each committee meeting. So if any members have any interest to declare, please do now. Um, can I also inform members that the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of March 2021 are at page 6 of the meeting. Uh, and uh, if members are content, uh, the uh, minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting. Uh, are members content? Okay. Uh, I will sign uh, uh, the minutes in due course. Okay, Clerk. Um, if there are any suggested uh, and agreed amendments, uh, which there isn't today, uh, so I, I, I'll sign as they are. Okay. Um, next item: business matters arising. Can I inform members that there are one item under matters arising at pages eleven uh, to twenty of the meeting pack, as requested by the committee. The commission has provided a further breakdown of the categories of expenditure, which resulted in the increase of four hundred ninety-six thousand pounds between the commission's indicative budget and its final budget for twenty-one twenty-two. Can I ask members if there are any comments or whether they are content uh, to note? Are members, have members any comments, first of all? No? Members content to note? Yes? If you could just uh, agree for the second answer, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next item of business, the review of the governance and accountability arrangements for the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman. This is an oral evidence session uh, by Mr. Uh, Peter Tindall. Um, can I refer members to pages 23 to 119 of the meeting pack for the relevant pages? Uh, and can I inform members that four experts will provide oral evidence today as part of the committee's review? First is Mr. Peter Tindall, uh, President of the International Ombudsman Institute, and he will be followed by Mr. Brian Thompson, Honorary Senior Research Fellow at the University of Liverpool. Dr. Chris Gill, lecturer at the University of Glasgow, and uh, Dr. Richard Kirkham, uh, uh, senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield. Can I inform members uh, that Mr. Tindall's written evidence can be found at pages 49 of the meeting pack? And can I welcome Mr. Tindall, President of the International Ombudsman Institute, to uh, the committee? Uh, Mr. Tindall, you're most welcome. Uh, can I advise you that uh, this session is being reported uh, by Hansard and the transcript will be published on the web, a committee web page uh, following that. So uh, you're very welcome uh, to be with us today. We thank you for your time. Uh, and can I invite you to make br brief opening remarks, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to speak with the committee today. I'm only sorry I can't be with you in person. The um, International Ombudsman Institute is the only global organization for ombudsman offices. Um, we have more than 200 members in more than 100 countries worldwide. Uh, the ombudsman model, as you know, originated in Sweden some 200 years ago and has spread across the globe. The legislation in Northern Ireland is legislation I'm personally very familiar with. I was in a position to offer advice to the a relevant assembly committee at the point at which it was drafted. And I have to tell you that that legislation is very highly regarded internationally and is often cited as a model of best practice. There are certain key features to ombudsman legislation which really feature around issues such as independence, such as powers, such as breadth of jurisdiction. And the legislation is exemplary in almost all of those instances. The governance of the Office of Ombudsman in Northern Ireland is very typical of the 200 or so members of the IOI, all of whom are public services ombudsmen in the same way as NIPSO is. And they uh, work in disparate jurisdictions and disparate legal systems right across the globe. The normal the normal governance arrangements for an ombudsman office are for the ombudsman to be accountable to the parliamentary body, in your case, of course, the Northern Ireland 
assembly and that arrangement is allowed for. There have, in recent times, since the legislation was developed, there has been a, the development of a standards, set of standards for ombudsman offices, which has most recently been adopted at UN level in a motion co-sponsored by the UK. Um, that set of principles, the Venice principles, so-called, set out the way in which ombudsman offices should be established, should be governed, and should operate. And uh, I have to say that of all of the ombudsman legislation and services internationally, the Northern Ireland Ombudsman is one of the closest to being fully compliant with those principles as it is currently arranged. Um, I touched upon in my written evidence the issue of independence of decision-making. The Ombudsman is a quasi-judicial post, and decisions made by the Ombudsman are normally, um, can only be challenged by the courts. It's important to, to note that the Ombudsman makes recommendations. The Ombudsman does not make uh, binding decisions. And the consequence of that is that any failure by a public body to implement those recommendations comes before yourselves as the Northern Ireland Assembly, and you're in a position to address that. The Ombudsman also reports to the Assembly via the annual report and via any special reports that need to be brought. As I say, those governance arrangements are typical of the 200 or so members of the IOI and are generally regarded as being best practice for ombudsman offices. So I'm very open to any questions, Chair, that members might have. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Pando, for that. I very much appreciate and appreciate your remarks uh, on this. Um, I have a brief question before I invite uh, other members. Um, you say that the NEPSO legislation is often cited as a model to follow elsewhere. What are its particular strengths and are there um, any areas that could be improved in your opinion? Um, it, it's strong in most regards. I think it's an important thing to say, but the process whereby the legislation is um, drafted and adopted by the parliament rather than by the uh, administration is, a very, um, is particularly strong. The fact, that the, um, the fact that the Ombudsman is appointed in an open and transparent fashion, again, that's compliant with best practice. The um, legislation ensures that the vast bulk of public services are within the Ombudsman's jurisdiction, again, best practice. It provides a range of powers for the Ombudsman to obtain evidence and to uh, reach decisions. Again, that's best practice, I suppose. What's slightly unusual in the NIPSO legislation is the, um, the element relating to local authority members' compliance with their code of practice. Um, that is less usual, but many ombudsman offices have responsibilities other than the um, core ones around maladministration. And so in that sense, it's not entirely unusual to have an additional responsibility beyond that. But I have to say, generally, you can point to most aspects of the legislation and say that this is fit for purpose and represents best international practice. That's very helpful. Thank you. I'll uh, open to other members. I'll start with Mr. Alan Chambers. Alan, um, uh, if... Uh, Broadcasting can bring you into the spotlight. Alan, have you any questions for Mr. Tindall? No, I, I'm fine, Chair. Thank you. Okay, and Mr. Allister, if broadcasting can bring in Mr. Jim Allister, please. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Tindall, for your evidence. Um, I just want to explore with you the last aspect that you mentioned. You were very effusive about the quality of the legislation that sets up the Ombudsman's Office, but I detected a little less enthusiasm for the matter that deals with local government standards. Is that not, in fact, an absurd situation whereby the Local Government Standards Commission Office 
is under the Ombudsman's office performing the contradictory but dual role of both investigator stroke prosecutor and decision maker. So as we have this questionable, particularly questionable in regard to Article 6 of the European Convention, this questionable position where the staff of the Local Government Standards Commissioner investigate a councillor's behaviour and then the same office provides the judge in determining the outcome. How is that tenable by any international standard? As I said, there's very um, limited precedent for this particular role. Um, I would share some of the um, issues that you raise. Um, my view would be that, um, or my experience would have been when I was Ombudsman in Wales of the situation in Wales, where the investigation was undertaken by the Ombudsman's office, but that hearings were held either by a local authority standards committee mm. for lesser um, issues or more serious ones by a separate adjudication panel. I think it, as these um, arrangements um, are particular to each jurisdiction, the jurisdiction concern needs to make its own ones. But I, I would have said that um, it would be a cleaner uh, arrangement if the investigation were undertaken separately to the adjudication and preferably by separate bodies. Can I say as well that the process of investigation is often very similar to the investigation of an allegation of maladministration. So the administrative resources of the office are often quite well placed to undertake that kind of role. But as you say, the, the combination of um, adjudication and investigation um, does provide challenges. Well, I welcome your view on that. And hopefully it's something that in due course will be attended to. You mentioned your service in Wales. One of the other witnesses we're to hear from today in their paper has reference to the Welsh Advisory Board. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, that was a body I established um, when I was Ombudsman in Wales um, to um, provide me with um, an extended advisory function and it involved people with backgrounds, for example, in public service who were able to offer advice and I used it particularly in the context of the development of a strategic plan and in um, operational planning so that I had some independent advice um, in that capacity. It was, it operated as an adjunct to the audit committee. Uh, apart from advisory functions, had it any actual powers? No, it had no executive functions because the Ombudsman was a corporation sole. But um, I chose to use it as a means of providing advice. And your experience of that was positive? It was, yes. Yes, it was positive indeed. A former um, member of a former Northern Ireland Ombudsman ultimately joined that panel, I think, Dr. Thomas Frawley, but that was after my tenure. And might that be a useful tool in our situation? I think um, having an advisory panel is something that can provide a, a useful additional um, set of, um, how would you put it, give the, a reference point for the Ombudsman. It's very important that the Ombudsman should be fully independent, but to be able to turn to people who are no longer active in particular spheres, but able to provide professional advice on them, it's quite helpful. But presumably it was at quite a high level. It wasn't on individual cases. No, 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 no. Um, 
It wasn't on individual cases. It was, as I say, on strategic planning and operational planning. And did that include any of the financial spending needs? Uh, the members of the audit committee um, were also members of the advisory panel. Were also the members? Sorry, did you say there were there was duality? Yes, yeah, there, was an o there, was, there was an overlap in membership, yes. So just explain how that works. You, you had an audit committee, as we have here, and then you had an advisory board of the same people wearing a different hat or of additional people? No, no, the, the audit committee plus additional people. People on the audit committee generally were there because of their expertise that they could contribute to the issue of audit. But uh, some of the other individuals, such as retired directors of services, would join them to form the advisory board. Right, so it was the audit committee plus? Yeah. And was that a suitable overlap, or do you think the... Yes, yes I think so. It worked. Um, it worked very effectively. It was possible to have meetings on the same day, for instance. So it was a practically efficient use of resource and provided a helpful, helpful advice. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alistair, and thank you, Mr. Tyndall, for uh, being with us today, for providing your evidence and for taking uh, questions from uh, our members. We are two members down today, but uh, uh, we, we, they've offered their apologies. But thank you for your time. It is appreciated. Thank you. Very pleased to have had the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next item of uh, business, uh, the review of the governance and accountability arrangements for the Northern Ireland um, Audit Office and the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman. It's an oral evidence session as well. Uh, Mr. Brian uh, Thompson uh, will be joining us. Can I inform members that Mr. Uh, Thompson's written evidence can be found on page 51 of the meeting pack. Um, can I welcome uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Thompson to uh, the committee today, and I thank him for uh, being with us. Uh, Mr. Thompson is an honorary senior research fellow at the University of Liverpool, and we're delighted to have you here today uh, with us. Can I advise you that the session is being reported by Hansard, Mr. Thompson, and the transcript will be published on the committee webpage following today. Um, can I invite you to make uh, brief opening remarks, and then we'll move to some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just want to uh, reiterate uh, the point in my written submission that uh, the uh, Audit Office and the Ombudsman are both very, very important institutions and that they have status of officer of the, of the Assembly. Um, whilst they are similar, there are some differences and it therefore might mean that the arrangements won't always be the same for both of them in all circumstances. Um, I think that one of the difficulties is that the Ombudsman isn't fully understood. Um, the Ombudsman, in a sense, acts a bit like a court in that it's independent and impartial. And sometimes people think that uh, the uh, Ombudsman acts as the, the champion of people uh, who are, have had a, a, a an unsatisfactory um, service from a, a public body. They will find against the public body if there's the evidence to do that. But if there isn't the evidence to do that, they won't. What they are, will be a champion of will be of good administration. So um, it may well be, as I say, that whilst it's useful to think of them together, and it's very important that the assembly supports them, and uh, you know, in that way, they're a part of the work in which the assembly does in holding the executive to account. Mm -hmm. Very important role that they have, and the role that the assembly has is terribly important. And your uh, re uh, review is an opportunity to remind everybody about th this relationship and indeed your own uh, leading role in th this particular regard. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. I appreciate uh, those uh, remarks and, and for your presentation. And again, thank you in, uh, for your for your time with us. Um, you encourage consideration of a public administration committee to look at performance. Uh, would there be any danger of fettering the Ombudsman's independence in that regard? 
Uh, no, I mean, I think uh, the idea that we have is that you've got the Public Accounts Committee, which works closely with the um, Comptroller and Auditor General. And um, you know, what often happens is that um, the uh, committee can follow up the work which has been done by an audit by the Comptroller, the Audit Office, or an investigation report which has been carried out by the Ombudsman. Uh, okay. I mean, the thing, of course, to bear in mind is that uh, the Assembly is also there to help to hold the Ombudsman to account. I mean, there has to be, yeah. but there's this very delicate balance to be achieved between uh, being, making sure there is independence and accountability. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chambers of Broadcasting, bring in Mr. Chambers. If he has any questions for Mr. Thompson. Uh, it's just a short question, Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Thompson said there that the uh, the ombudsman is the is the, the, the champion of, of good administration rather than individual cases. Uh, um, is it the case that would you agree that maybe its very existence uh, ensures uh, that there is a continuing high level of administration within public life, just simply because that office is there and, and, and can't intervene? I think that that is the case. Um, um, but one thing which is going to help that, I think, is the power which was um, put into the 2016 legislation and is going to be coming on stream later this year, I think, which is a role called complaint standards. And mm -hmm. one thing that, that will do will be to to encourage and to assist public bodies in developing their own capacity to deal with complaints um, which come up. Because, of course, the Ombudsman is only coming in to deal with complaints after the organisation has had the first opportunity to try and resolve it. So, so that's uh, terribly important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chambers. Um, uh, Mr Jim Allister. Yeah, Mr. Thompson, a couple of things I wanted to pursue with you. Uh, your evidence very much looks at both the Audit Office and the Public Service Ombudsman. Yes. Now, the general international practice in regard to uh, audit offices appears to tend towards there being a corporate board to oversee the work. Um, so why should an audit office have an independent board, which personally I think is a good thing, and an ombudsman not? Okay. Um, first of all, um, I know that in New Zealand there is no statutory board. In the Republic of Ireland there's no statutory board for the audit office. Um, so to that extent, I think... Uh, Westminster and Scotland and Wales are a little bit different. And so far as I know in the common law world, I don't think there's a statutory board for any of the ombudsmen. Um, but as, as I said in my opening remarks, there could be the possibility for differences between the two. And I think one of the reasons why you would want to have the difference for an ombudsman is that um, I mentioned the complaint standards work. Um, there's also the uh, power which uh, has just been exercised and we're waiting for the report of the own initiative investigation. This is the first time that a UK ombudsman has got this and the Welsh Ombudsman Office followed uh, in the wake of the example of the, the Northern Ireland legislation. Um, Westminster has had the opportunity to, to create this power in the past and hasn't done it. And uh, I think it is quite important that um, that kind of investigation could be critical of the departments that it looks at and um, the departmental response you know, might take it on the chin or, or might not. So in those circumstances, I think that the Ombudsman has to have as much independence as possible in order to be able to, to carry out that job and to do it properly. Um, if I can give you an example, the um, Office of the Audit, the Audit Office has a power which is slightly similar to an own initiative. It's called um, a value for money audit. 
And there it's quite clear that the officer at the corporation, so, um, has the final decision on whether or not they're going to do something about that. And in the, um, the legislation which governs the relationship between the statutory board of the Audit Office at Westminster and the Comptroller and Auditor General, it's very interesting that legislation says that they've both got to agree things. That it's not just that the board will have the final say on, on the, the, the estimate they're going to put forward to Westminster uh, or their plans, it's done jointly. And in my evidence, I said this was to be a statutory board for the Ombudsman. I would want to see it on that basis. But actually, um, if pushed, I would prefer not to see a statutory board, but to have um, uh, the current arrangements and perhaps augmented by what uh, Mr. Tyndall was talking about from his own experience of the advisory panel, uh, which uh, supplements the uh, Audit and Risk Committee in the governance and accountability arrangements for the Welsh Public Services Ombudsman. So are you really signalling to us that you think a statutory board might or might be seen to be bettering the necessary independence of the Ombudsman? Well, ordinarily, if, when you have a statutory board, there will be the non-executive members will be in the majority. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the position, um, that was the position in the legislation which um, looks as if it's not going to happen, uh, a draft public service ombudsman bill. So I, I would not be, be in favour of that. I think it, might, it possibly works for uh, the auditor because the legislation specifically states that there is joint responsibility between the auditor as a corporation's soul and the statutory board. Yes. There is something of a halfway house of a non-statutory board in GB in the health services ombudsman, is that correct? Uh, well, they um, what they have is that um, the two separate offices of parliamentary and health service ombudsman, the two offices are held by the one person. Yes. And they sort of operate together, although they're not formally merged in the way that um, 2016 acted for, in Northern Ireland. And so they have a unitary board, but the ombudsman is still a corporation soul, and therefore, in a sense, it's a bit like... Um, the advisory uh, situation in Wales. But actually, it, I mean, it's, it's not a statutory board and the Ombudsman at the moment is still a corporation, so... So it doesn't really have any powers of no power? <laughs> well, I guess it uh, doesn't have power, but it perhaps has influence. Yeah. And do you think the Welsh model or that uh, health service model would be beneficial to us, or is it just an unnecessary adjunct? Um, it could be done that way, but I mean, I think um, given that the, the Welsh office is a little bit bigger and, and the population size is large in Wales, it's perhaps a, a better model for Northern Ireland. Yeah, what we have is a better model. In, uh, the fo fo following the, the, the Welsh example, the Welsh, you think similar size and similar sort of jurisdictions, I, I think that's, that's not a, a bad model to follow. Okay. In, ter in terms of the, I'm maybe going to take you slightly outside your terms of reference, but in regard to the powers of the Ombudsman when they find a public authority to have been guilty of maladministration. It can be a bit limp, can it not? It can look that way because it is only a power of, of recommendation. Um, but um, sort of a, a colleague uh, came up with the phrase that um, what the Ombudsman has is a mandate of persuasion, not coercion. Because uh, what we're dealing with in maladministration is something which could be a breach of the law, but um, 
might not be. And that's the great thing about the, uh, the office and that, that term maladministration, that it covers a wide range of things. Uh, and indeed, I mean, that was one of the reasons why the Ombudsman was created in the United Kingdom in the first place, that um, it was designed to supplement uh, political action and legal action. And then it sort of uh, overlaps a little bit. What, what would you think of the idea so, of following an example which exists within the audit office of enabling the Ombudsman to charge out where there's an adverse finding for their services. Would that bring a little concentration of the mind of a council or someone else found guilty of maladministration? Well, um, I mean, I think that the way it, it tends to operate is that it's really a role for, for you as um, uh, an MLA and for the Assembly more generally, that it is a political uh, pressure that helps to bring about uh, compliance with a finding of administration causing, causing injustice. You don't think um, that a, a public authority in a council, for example, that because of it mal maladministration which has been found against it, had to pay the ombudsman's investigative charges, that that would maybe bring it home to them as a body sustained by ratepayers, that they really would need to clean up their act? Uh, I mean, that is an interesting sanction, but, uh, but as I say, I mean, um, what has tended to happen is that you don't need to get to that in position. I mean, I mean, some years ago, I did do some work um, for the Department of the Environment where they looked, uh, this was in the 1980s, and they were looking at the former Commissioner for Complaints in Northern Ireland, um, because that was at that stage the only ombudsman under which, under the legislation where if someone had their complaint upheld, the person could go to a court. Mm. And that, and what the 2016 Act did was to, when it merged the Commissioner for Complaints with the Assembly Ombudsman, it then made uh, that ability to go to court available to the jurisdiction um, of the uh, Assembly Ombudsman and beyond the councils. Um, now, I'm, I'm not absolutely in favour of that, because I think you don't want to go to court if you can avoid it. And um, it seemed to me that uh, the opportunity for the Assembly to um, bring you know, sort of somebody in and uh, you know, have a, an evidence session with them. I mean, for example, the Parliamentary Ombudsman, they have this power to do that, that if the Ombudsman feels that the, uh, the maladministration is not going to be remedied, then they can lay a special report before Parliament. And what usually happens then is that um, a committee, uh, these days it's the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, will ha have a session with them. And when that was done in the past, it always led to um, a, a change of mind and the Ombudsman was eventually satisfied with uh, what the public body was prepared to do. But do we have that power? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Because mm. very often they... Use it because the, uh, uh, as it were, the public bodies have on the whole tended to decide they want to go along with the situation. Because mm -hmm. the experience of some constituents of mine is that when they make a complaint they feel very aggrieved that all they get mm. at the end of it, even though the complaint has been withheld, is a letter of apology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, sometimes um, a letter of apology is, isn't enough for, for some people, but it, it may be felt um, appropriate in the circumstances. But, I mean, as I say, if uh, there was a public body that was resisting uh, complying with the recommendation, that is something which um, can be done, that a, a report could be made that, and then the... Um, the Assembly could uh, make its views known on the matter. OK, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Alistair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson, for uh, taking our questions and for giving your evidence today. Your uh, time is very much appreciated by us. Thank you. You're very welcome. Glad to be okay. able to give help. Thank you. Um, uh, next item of the agenda,
uh, members the review of the governance and accountability arrangements for Northern Ireland Audit Office and Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman. The oral evidence this time uh, will be by Dr. Chris Gill. Uh, can I inform members that Dr. Chris Gill's written evidence can be found on page 65 of the meeting pack? Um, and if broadcasting could bring in Dr. Gill, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Gill, you can hear us okay, yes? I can hear you, thank you, Chair. Okay, you're very welcome to uh, today's uh, session and uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, just for uh, members uh, to note, Dr. Gill is a lecturer at the University of Glasgow. Dr. Gill, can I advise you that the session is being reported by Hansard and the transcript will be published on the committee webpage following today's session. And can I invite you to make brief opening remarks before we proceed to questions from members? Thank you, Dr. Gill. Thank you very much for that introduction, Chair. Um, good afternoon, and um, thank you very much for asking me here today. Um, so I think there's four points that I'd just like to highlight from my um, written evidence, and, and some of these echo what you've already heard from uh, Peter Tyndall and Brian Thompson. Um, the first point is I think that independence really is a core value for the Ombudsman, and that any efforts that the committee is making to enhance accountability has got to be mindful of the potential knock-on effect in terms of encroaching on the Ombudsman's effectiveness and independence. So I think although um, there's clearly a need to balance those two things, I think independence really is at the heart of the Ombudsman's role and is something that needs to be very jealously guarded. Um, the second point is sort of slightly contrary to that, really, and uh, there has been a recent expansion in the powers of uh, the Ombudsman, particularly in the devolved jurisdictions of the United Kingdom. And Northern Ireland has been a, a leader of the pack here. Um, Brian Thompson mentioned own initiative powers. There's also the complaint standards authority powers that are coming online. And I think both of these powers represent a very significant extension to what the traditional UK Ombudsman model can actually um, do. So I think it is appropriate and it's a good time to consider um, how accountability arrangements um, can be optimized. And I think the, the core question is really around whether some kind of board, statutory or otherwise, whether it's called a board or something perhaps more limited in terms of a panel, um, would be a useful addition to really reflect modern, modern governance uh, arrangements in public service organizations. Because I think the Ombudsman uh, model does look slightly out of keeping when we look at other um, similar types of independent um, public bodies like audit uh, bodies. Um, the third point is that I think, you know, although parliamentary, parliamentary scrutiny and, and the work that the committee does is highly valuable, um, clearly you can't provide all of the scrutiny of the Ombudsman that is required. So I think that the work that you do needs to be really supported by other mechanisms that are capable of providing objective and credible information, which can then be used for uh, scrutiny um, purposes. I think in the Ombudsman context, one of the things that's particularly um, sort of different or distinctive is that you have individual complainants bringing um, their cases. And so I think there's a need to satisfy those individuals that they've been dealt with fairly, that the outcome is fair, that the process that they've been, uh, that has been used to deal with their complaint has been fair. So in addition to considering the overall structure of corporate corporate governance and whether you're satisfied with that, I think there's probably a need to look at a wider suite of options that can provide public assurance about the quality of the Ombudsman's work. And that leads me to, to the final uh, point that I wanted um, to raise is that I think there have been a number of mechanisms that have been developed recently from within the Ombudsman sector, largely as sort of self-regulatory, if you like, uh, efforts to improve things. Um, these are things like independent service complaint reviewers um, who will actually look at complaints about the service provided by the Ombudsman, um, things like consumer panels where the Ombudsman looks at the experiences of former complainants but also general members of the public and tries to advise the Ombudsman on, on providing a kind of customer focused uh, and I suppose um, person-centric uh, model for the ombudsman uh, and finally things like peer review and independent review which are conducted on a periodic basis um, and so all of these i think are potential ways 
of trying to enhance accountability. Um, one of the things in terms of you know which of these would be appropriate for Northern Ireland really I think depends on what you see as the particular problems or issues that arise in, in that jurisdiction because I think there is a menu of potential options that you could look at but a, a lot of it depends on what you identify I think as the particular problems that have arisen in the past here or that you think might arise in future. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. That's very helpful. I appreciate um, your uh, evidence. Um, just before we proceed to questions by members, you list in your paper areas where reporting duty might be established. One of those areas is the introduction of peer reviews. How successful have been uh, peer reviews uh, in other jurisdictions in holding uh, the Ombudsman to account? I think it's very early days. Um, so a peer review hasn't been used very extensively uh, in ombudsman jurisdictions around the work, uh, the world to, to date. Um, so it's very early days in terms of that being used as a technique. Um, I participated, in fact, with Peter Tyndall um, in one of the first peer reviews that was conducted in the UK of the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman. Um, and I think the consensus was that it was a, a good experiment. It was a worthwhile thing to do. Um, the uh, Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, I think, found it a useful addition to its scrutiny work and was able, I think, to take its scrutiny of the um, Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman that little bit further. So I think it's a potentially good model. I think there are questions um, leading on from that just around how peer review panels should be composed and exactly what it is that you would like peer review to do. Um, I wrote a, a short uh, paper which was really looking at those issues, which was really around, I think, if you want it to be a sort of gold standard in accountability terms, you might want a purely independent panel rather than a peer review arrangement where it's effectively ombudsman colleagues reviewing other ombudsman colleagues. Um, but on the other hand, the, the downside of that is that you end up with people who aren't experts in the area, and that can lead to quite generic recommendations or lack of understanding of the context. So I think it depends what you want to do. Do you want to improve things? Do you want the um, ombudsman to be able to learn and reflect on experience? Or is it kind of a, a stricter you know, scrutiny accountability model, in which case you might want more independence? But yeah, I think it's potentially a very fruitful approach. And I think it's something that, that more and more ombudsman schemes are going to be looking to do. OK, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, could broadcasting bring in Mr. Alan Chambers, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Gill, for your attendance today. Uh, just, uh, I'm asking this question really in the role of devil's advocate, but uh, in your conclusions, uh, you've said that independence is a core value for the Ombudsman, and efforts to enhance accountability must be mindful of the potential for encroaching on the Ombudsman's effectiveness. Um, but could you also not maybe make a case for the fact that uh, if there was more accountability, that it would increase public confidence in the role um, of this office? Uh, and that, that must be equally important as well. I think I think that's right. So I think it is it is about getting that balance because I think in an ideal world, what you want to achieve is something whereby you know your focus on accountability is is supporting the ombudsman's independence rather than sort of detracting from it. Um, one of the problems with public accountability and scrutiny processes is that actually they can sometimes actually decrease public confidence by raising some of these issues. Um, there's a, a fairly large academic literature on whether accountability increases or decreases public trust. You would think it would automatically increase it because people can see that people are being held to account, but often it can just be very difficult to satisfy, particularly disappointed complainants, for example, um, that they have been dealt with fairly. And, and almost know however effective your governance arrangements are, however transparent an organization is, I think it can be very, very difficult to turn things around and to actually get people to trust an institution when they've been let down. So yeah, I think the link isn't automatic between enhancing accountability and buttressing the public reputation of an organization and, and allowing it to be effective in its other work. And I think that's why there needs to be a certain amount of 
of caution exercise and, and really not going too far. Um, but at the same time, I, I do think that probably some additional accountability arrangements uh, are really required. Um, and I think that's just because otherwise the ombudsman can be left quite exposed when people criticize it and say, actually, it wasn't a fair process or that outcome wasn't right. It's hard for the ombudsman, apart from to say, you know, read the report, read the arguments in the report as to why that is the case. So I, I, I favor some additional accountability arrangements because I think it makes it easier for that conversation, at least, to be had with the public about why what the ombudsman is doing is actually fair and appropriate. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kimbrough. Uh, Mr. Alistair of Broadcasting, bring in Mr. Jim Alistair, please. So, Dr. Gill, how do you avoid either an advisory board or peer review or anything like that just being and appearing to be mere window dressing? I think this is tricky, and I think I think one of the things that uh, that can be done, which is helpful, is is by having the involvement of a parliamentary committee, for example, in the appointment of either, for example, a peer review panel or of the advisory board. I think one of the potential weaknesses, um, if I've understood correctly, how some of the other UK ombudsmen that have advisory boards uh, go about appointing those, is that the ombudsman makes the appointments. Um, and I think if you had perhaps a little bit more independence in terms of and transparency in terms of how those appointments were made and who was ultimately responsible for deciding, or at least some input from um, from outside of the organisation, that might help avoid that perception. I think there needs to be um, within the accountability process some parliamentary accountability and I think if yourselves as a committee are confident that there are good structures uh, in place to, to hold the ombudsman to account then I think you can focus more on what I think should be a perhaps a slightly bigger part of your role which is actually supporting the ombudsman to scrutinize public services and hold them to account um, I think the focus on the ombudsman can seem to me sometimes slightly sort of navel gazing when it's really about trying to support their work in, in public services but, uh, but and holding we, them to account. Do we not have a particular difficulty in Northern Ireland in being seen to enhance independence with a, for a body which is there to scrutinise government departments if the government is formed on a mandatory coalition basis where virtually everyone is in government and therefore those who would be appointing the independent scrutineers would be appointing those to scrutinise uh, an ombudsman which is examining that very government. Hmm. I, mean, I think that, 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 that clearly is a difficult uh, question um, and, and obviously something that is specific to Northern Ireland. And I, and, I, and I think that's what I was trying to get at in my opening remarks. So what I didn't get a clear sense of from um, the review and, and its terms of reference was, I mean, I could see from, from the audit, um, the uh, audit officer's perspective where that was coming from, but I, I wasn't really clear on where you thought that there were gaps in relation to the ombudsman, perhaps, or, or where experience had suggested that there were issues in terms of accountability. So, so yeah, I, th I think I think some of that is, is perhaps context that I'm not sure I can advise on, rather than simply just sort of saying here's a menu of potential choices depending on on what you think the issues are. Well, I, I speak for myself, but. I think my own view is that there, there are greater and more significant gaps with the auditor, audit office than there are with the ombudsman, because I think it is. If the ombudsman's office is to command public confidence, then it must be seen to be fiercely independent. Mm. And um, therefore, I'm a little bit wary about setting it in a context of supervision by those who, in fact, have also got the vested interest in the ones being investigated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, that certainly makes sense. But just to reduce it down, does, and it, does the Welsh Advisory Board add anything of something? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that it does from, say, a, a public perception perspective. 
for example. So if, if the aim of trying to set up these additional accountability arrangements is to convince a prospective complainant that they're going to be dealt with fairly or someone who has complained and has been disappointed that they will be dealt with fairly, then I'm, I'm not sure that an advisory board which has been appointed by the ombudsman is going to make a huge amount of difference to how that person would, would feel. I think if there was a greater element of, of independence in terms of how that board was appointed and perhaps if it was uh, on a statutory footing and so on, from that perspective, it might be better. On the other hand, as I say, there's, there's various things that you might expect this kind of board to do. I mean, it, it sounded from what Peter Tyndall was saying that he found that very useful. And I could imagine that if you're leading an ombudsman organization, having that element of external input would be very useful, very beneficial. And you would imagine that it would improve the way in which the organization is run. So. I think it comes down to what, what is it that you're what is it that you're trying to do with these arrangement and who is it that you're trying to satisfy. Uh, I think it seems to me that it could be a useful uh, appendage to the organisation. It could help run the organisation smoothly, um, but whether it would help convince sceptics uh, that the ombudsman was really being held to account, I'm, I'm not sure. Of course, the, the disappointed complainant uh, always has in theory at least, recourse to the courts? They do, but I think it's, it's, it's relatively uh, limited uh, in terms of uh, what they're, they're able to do. And, and often what people are disappointed about is not necessarily um, something that they're, that they're able to actually get remedy through the, through the court for. Um, and it can be quite difficult to, to launch those kinds of actions. So yeah, certainly in, in theory, there is the option of, of going to court, but how accessible that is to people, uh, you know, certainly it, it's not something that is done very often. So, so many people who are complaint, who are disappointed by the ombudsman's work, you know, they'll leave it at that. They won't be happy, but they won't be taking their cases any further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alistair. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gill, for uh, taking our questions and for being with us today. We appreciate your time. Thank you again. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, to continue with the review of uh, the Governance and Accountability Business from Northern Ireland Audit Office and Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman, our next evidence session is with Dr. Richard Kirkham. And uh, I, can I ask uh, broadcast to bring in Dr. Kirkham? Dr. Kirkham, you're very, very welcome. Uh, to the committee. We appreciate uh, your time today and for taking our questions. Um, can I inform members uh, that the evidence provided by Dr. Kirkham can be provided uh, is on page 75 of the meeting pack. Uh, Dr. Kirkham is a senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield, Sheffield and very welcome uh, today. Can I advise you, Doctor, that the session is being reported by Hansard and the transcript will be published on the committee webpage following today's session. And can I invite you to make brief remarks before questions from members. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me um, to get evidence to the committee. Um, by way of brief introduction, my, the main points I want to make are these, and they're probably coming quite familiar now. You've had, <laughs> I'm the fourth uh, witness today. Uh, but, but first, the, the legislation for the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman Office was, as Peter described, uh, uh, Peter Sindel described, upgraded in 2016. Uh, and yeah, uh, we may become aware of, over time of minor imperfections to the act, but at this stage, I wouldn't pr propose any further amendments to it. It's, it's as Peter Tyndall described, it's generally regarded as setting a very high benchmark in the Ombudsman sector. So I certainly agree with that comment. Uh, second, as far as I'm aware, the office also does a pretty good job in Northern Ireland and plays an important role in the overall arrangements for the scrutiny of public sector activity in Northern Ireland. For me, the main question here and elsewhere in the UK is whether enough is being made of the work of the Ombudsman uh, and indeed whether legislative bodies such as the Assembly engage sufficiently with the institution. Uh, third, in terms of accountability and oversight of the Ombudsman Office, in my written submission I raised a few areas that the committee might want to look at. Uh, I noted that ideally the Assembly as a whole would have more capacity to, to work with the Ombudsman. Uh, I read my submission again in the morning, by the way, and I think I underestimated, underestimated the role of the Assembly Commission. But, but nevertheless, my, my suggestion was that the uh, memorandum of understanding could be expanded a little 
to expect more from the Ombudsman in terms of reporting duties, uh, and the committee could perhaps expect more of itself in terms of the areas that it should be interested in. I suggested too that the committee might want to explore with the Ombudsman uh, whether there would be value in introducing an advisory board. I know you've been looking at that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and however, fourthly, I listened to Professor Hill's evidence uh, last month, and I echo his sentiments that if there is a balance of risk here to be had between too much independence and too much accountability, in the context of a relatively small office in Northern Ireland, I would err every time and decide too much independence. Uh, but lest you, as a committee, you'd be worried about granting the OMS and too much of a free reign, uh, I would echo the comments we've just heard from Chris Gill, that, that in practice now, the OMS sector itself is developing kind of a, a toolkit of different options to add layers of scrutiny and insight and engagement. Um, to, uh, and you, had, you ended there with a discussion about the courts. I, I think uh, the comments were right that the courts are very rarely used as a mode of redress, but they do offer an important channel for the courts to scrutinise the procedural fairness of ombudsman decision-making. And I note, actually, in Northern Ireland, the role looking at conduct cases has already gone to court on a few occasions, for instance. So, you know, that's, an, that's it may not be frequent, but it is an important opportunity to, to sort of drive home a few messages that the courts get every now and then. So I wouldn't underestimate that. And, and several ombudsman schemes have moved to be ever more transparent in their decision-making processes, such as publishing all the decisions. So there, there's a range of things going on out there in the, in the sector, which I, I think you can take some confidence in. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirkham. I appreciate you providing your uh, evidence uh, to us today. Um, just before we proceed to um, uh, members' questions, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, a few questions. Um, I'll, um, no, I'll go to Jim Allister first, actually. Jim, Jim, Jim Allister, if broadcasting to bring him in. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for your evidence. Uh, as I think you identified yourself, being the fourth in the routine, we've probably covered most of the ground. Uh, but uh, I am interested in this subject of whether or not uh, you can successfully marry the eminent independence of an ombudsman with enhanced oversight uh, without one prejudicing the other. Uh, you did make your, it was you who in your written submissions talked about the Welsh Advisory Board. I asked the last witness if that was anything more than window dressing. I'd like to get your take on that. Is there real value in that, or is it just something you do to be seen to be doing something in terms of supervision? And Chris Hill suggested that in terms of perception, it might not add much, and, and I, I guess he must be right on that. But I think it has two big values, potentially. One is the value, I think, for you as, as, a, as a committee you might get some reassurance from knowing that there are a body of other people out there who I suspect, you know, they're quite eminent people, they're very experienced people. You Hopefully you get a diverse bunch of talents in the room who will be asking some difficult questions just like you as a committee would. So you, okay, you're right, it's, it's not fully independent, it's not transparent, we don't, know, we don't get to witness these discussions, but you can get, I think you can get some confidence that there is something quite important going on here and that these people will more often than not be asking difficult questions of the ombudsman. And, and I think as well internally I, I would have thought this is quite a good opportunity for any office holder to sort of road test some of their ideas uh, if there are difficult decisions or, or challenges that the office makes you know that they that, that, you know that they yeah get this critical input from critical friends uh, so, so I think that could have value and, and bad ideas or bad arguments can hopefully be weeded out earlier in the process. It's certainly not going to be a guarantee of full accountability. I don't think uh, uh, my claim would be that. But it, it's, it's another opportunity that, that I think helps improve the governance uh, of ombudsman schemes. In terms of the Welsh Advisory Board, 
Does it meet in private or public? As far as I'm aware, it's in private. You can see the minutes of the meeting, but of course the minutes are so going to be... The, the minutes are published? Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. You started your submission or your summary today by uh, praising the Northern Ireland legislation. Does that include the provisions that allow the ombudsman, in, when acting as local government commissioner on standards, to be judge and prosecutor? I, I noticed your discussion earlier on with Peter Tindall on that one. Um, I haven't looked at this in detail. It's still relatively new. Uh, I'd echo the comments of Peter Tindall that it's unusual. I, I don't know what the thought process was when the legislation was passed, because I think, as you were suggesting, surely it must the, the, the stronger model would be to separate out the two roles, and that's what they did. Yeah. Well um, having said that, I, I wouldn't lose complete faith with it without any sort of further inquiry in as far as, you know, as I say, there is this route to get to court as well, to test uh, various elements of, of the process. Um, I, I, I'm, so I've got no insight, but I'm presuming there's a cost issue, because what's the alternative? Would we set up a new panel or a new sort of uh, tribunal to be doing those, that sort of work? But, but that would, yeah. I suspect, be my favoured solution. Okay, thank you, Brian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alistair. Uh, just, just follow on from the point that Mr. Alistair raised in, in relation to uh, the advisory board uh, in Wales. Do, do, do you believe then that the audit, audit and risk committee's remit is not wide enough, or could it be widened further? Uh, my sense is, is it's, there's an overlap between the two roles, but there is something different going on there, which is which is broader, looking at wider strategy, um, perhaps looking more at wider performance issues. Uh, I'd like to think it was also a forum to you know, have a genuine challenging conversation. Uh, I, I note the, the Parliamentary Health Service Ombudsman site makes it very clear that the Parliamentary Ombudsman, it's, he's the final decision maker in all of this. Uh, but I'd like to think when you get that body of good people together, uh, of experience and talent, they are asking challenging questions. And I think I just, my, my look at the remit is it just covers a wider range of issues than what yeah. a classic kind of audit committee would do. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirkham. Um Alan Chambers, if Spotlight could bring in uh, Alan Chambers, please. Thank you, Chair. No, I, I have no questions, but just want to thank Dr. Kirkham for his evidence. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you, uh, Alan. Okay, Dr. Kirkham, thank you very much. Um, we're two members down today of the committee, so questions are quite brief, but thank you very much for your time with us. We appreciate your evidence and for being uh, so open with us. Thank you very much again. Thanks a lot. Okay, members. Um, would... would uh, would members like to hear evidence from comparator bodies in other jurisdictions, for instance, for audit, perhaps the chairpersons of statutory boards to sit as a panel, or for the ombudsman, the chairpersons of the audit and risk uh, committees to sit as a panel? Jim, have you any, Jim or Alan, have you any um, view on that? If broadcasting, bring Jim and Alan up. Yeah. I have no strong views on the talk, sure. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think, Chair, where I am, where I am in this at the moment is that I'm not persuaded that we need to do very much pertaining to the Ombudsman uh, in terms of changing how things are because I think if we add more layers we are threatening the independence of the um, Ombudsman. So Yes, I'm interested in in the Welsh Advisory Board, but at this moment in time, I'm not persuaded they would add a great deal. But you're you're asking should we hear evidence from people who have operated such systems? Yeah, yeah. Just as a you know, just as a comparative in, in other jurisdictions. But I take on point. I take the point. I think it was Dr. Gill that said it. 
the, the benchmark is already very high in terms of ombudsman here, and, and, and they're, they're quite satisfied from their opinion of it. So I, I can I, I can understand your point, Jim, from that point of view. Um, the one area I'm unhappy with, as you've gathered, is in the local government side. Yeah, I picked that up quite strongly. Yes. Yeah, um, the, the, there was also a, a number of contradictions from what uh, a, a number of our uh, guests had said as well. I know you picked up on them. Yeah. Um, so how, 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 how would you like to proceed? Are you, so would you be keen then, Jim, um, I know Alan said there's no view on this, but would you be keen then Jim, in the hearing from chairpersons of statutory boards for audit so we can compare... Uh, uh, bodies in other jurisdictions would that be yeah, that, worth there doing? Be, or? There, might be some, there might be some value in that. Uh, we're talking about the Scots, Scots and the Welsh, presumably, or something of that nature. I don't think we yeah. want to get down a very long rabbit hole in any of this, but. Uh, no. <laughs> if, if we could leave it to the, the audit office, the Scots and the Welsh. Yeah. Um, bring in the chairpersons of the statutory boards. Yeah. I mean, if we could get arra that arranged, hopefully for our next committee meeting, okay. and then we can have another think then about the the ombudsman, whether you want the chairpersons of the Advisory audit boards. risk committees or yeah. the boards as, as in the Welsh, it, you know, hmm. it's given them hmm. a, an opportunity to, to prepare, yeah. but as you say, how far you want to go with that? Do you, do you want me to go ahead and organise the um, chairpersons of the statutory boards for audit for now, and we could come back to the ombudsman? Well, we could ask for the for written submissions, and then if yes, we thought there was that, anything in them, that, that's certainly that's an submission. option. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that, that that's a better suggestion, yeah. uh, Clark. We proceed that way. I think. Yep. Yeah. No bother. Okay. Thanks very much, members. Um, next item of business, research paper, public audit governance, the role of the accounting officer. Can I inform members that the research paper can be found on pages 1, 2, 4 of the meeting pack? Members should note that there is an error in the page which attributes the research request to the research request uh, to the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, this has now been rectified and the paper will be published as amended. Uh, can I also inform members that the comparative research focuses on the governance around the role of the controller and auditor general as accounting officer for the audit offices around the UK? In summary, the governance around the role of the accounting and accountable officer in UK audit offices is broadly similar in structure and not dissimilar from the governance and accounting officer's role elsewhere in the public sector. Uh, the main differences are around the role of the Department of Finance. The table at pages one to five of the meeting pack highlights those differences for members' consideration. Unlike elsewhere in the UK, the accounting officer is appointed by the department, the department of, in this instance, the Department of Finance. Uh, the department also appoints the external auditor, and although the audit committee reviews the accounts, they are agreed by the Department of Finance with the external auditor. Are members content that we forward the research paper to the Minister of Finance, asking for his observations on the differences identified and seek his views on potential improvements or reforms in the context of the committee's review? Are members content or have any thoughts? Content. Thank you. Um, okay, Clerk. Uh, next item of business scrutiny schedule. I refer members to page 141 of the meeting pack for the scrutiny schedule and ask members if they're content to note. Content. Okay. And the uh, next item of business correspondence. Can I inform members that there are three items of correspondence to pages 145 to 155 of the meeting pack and ask members if there are any comments or whether they are content to note correspondence? Are members content to note? Content. Oh. Thank you. The uh, next item of business, any other business? Can I ask members if you have any other business to raise? No. No. Okay, and the final item of business is the date, time and place of the next meeting. Can I inform members that the dates of the next audit committee meetings are as follows, the 5th of May, the 2nd of June and the 7th of July. Can I ask members if they are content to continue with the hybrid meetings uh, if restrictions permit? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you members. That was a good session today and uh, we got through it in a very good time. You'll be early for your committee today, Jim. I will, yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> no escapes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much to you all and thank you as well for your assistance as always. Um,